Hi, this is Tom Gimble from Foreigner, and you are listening to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. Uh, today, is a, we've got another great interview. I'm really excited because I've got Tom Gimble on the line here from the band Foreigner. Yes, that Foreigner, the Foreigner. Yes, yes, big rock star here at the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. It's really excited. Uh, before we jump in, though, let's uh, thank our wonderful sponsor, Positively Pittsburgh Live, pplmag.com, uh, Pittsburgh's first internet radio and TV network, online community magazine, and business directory. Listen to, watch, download, receive emails with the latest audio and video created by members of the community. All kind of cool stuff that you can do there, Positively Pittsburgh Live. You can learn all kind of great stuff, and you're going to get to hear awesome interviews like this one from the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, go to LudiniRockAndRollCircus.com uh, for all your Ludini needs. We're, there's a new uh, interview every Wednesday, and every Saturday is a brand new music podcast where you get to hear uh, some of the great music by the, all these artists that we've been talking to here on the circus. As I said, I've got Tom Gimble uh, on the line here, multi-instrumentalist, uh, plays rhythm, guitar, keyboard, sax, and flute. It was the music of blood, sweat, and tears in Chicago that truly fired his interest in the sound of horns, equally influenced by progressive rock bands. It was a groundbreaking work of the big band trumpet player Maynard Ferguson that changed his life. Uh, Tom says, when I started playing sax, I tried to sound like him, learning to nail the high notes, reveals Gimbal. This uh, was good training to play the solo on Urgent years later. Who'd have thunk it? Uh, Tom Gimbal, <laughs> welcome to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great, Lou. Thanks. Uh, just it's triggering some memories of of hearing "Blood, Sweat, and Tears." You know that song, "Spinning Wheel," was oh, such yeah. a big deal when it came out. And, and after that, Chicago came around with a very similar sound, but uh, incredible talent with Terry Catt, the baritone vocal. It was just everywhere on the radio at that point, and uh, drums became a big deal. You know, there was like a snare drum solo <laughs> 25 or 64 or something. <laughs> Makes yeah. me smile. And a snare drum solo. So that spawned a giant generation, my age group, you know, six great kids. Everybody wanted to be a drummer. So, so that's, uh, so, so you play, cool. you play a lot of instruments. The drums, that was where you started? Perhaps, yeah, sure. That's what I mean. Everyone in the whole school played drums. <laughs> <laughs> Between Ringo. Between Ringo and Blood, Sweat, and or Chicago, that, everybody wanted to be a drummer. So you started off, you got excited when you heard that music. You, you wanted to play the drums. What happened? What do you do? You start playing in bands? Give us the sort of uh, Reader's Digest version of how you kind of came oh, okay. up. Okay. Yeah, well, that was the problem. We wanted to have a band, but we had nothing but drummers. So <laughs> somebody had to learn the guitar, and I couldn't wait. I sort of always wanted to. You know, Elvis was was really my hero, and uh, John Lennon and the Beatles, rhythm guitar. I always just wanted to strum a guitar and, and sing. So uh, I couldn't wait to get my hands on guitar, and I've been playing one ever since. That was seventh grade. Along the way, I'd learned keyboards, and later I picked up the flute. Uh, when there was a Jethro Tull craze going around, and that led me to the saxophone, which was really much more about blues and jazz and real rock. That's a, that's just such a wonderful instrument. It's it's become basically my best friend. So, uh, yeah, along the way, just tons of singing. I always sang, always wanted to sing. I still want to sing right now, this minute, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to spare you over the phone. And when I was a little kid, they had me singing anywhere that would let me. I was just never shy. And so I, I was really lucky I get to do all those things in Foreigner and work with such incredible talents like uh, Mick Jones and Kelly Hansen, our vocalist, who was just phenomenal. You uh, took it to the next level by going to Berkeley uh, College of Music. Um, what, what, first of all, what did you, since you play all these instruments, what was your concentration uh, at Berkeley? I was really into jazz. We talked about uh, Maynard Ferguson, and I really was into that big band thing. I wanted to be an arranger. Uh, my, my degree that I got at Berkeley, a, ma or a bachelor's degree, is jazz composition and arranging. Mm -hmm. So I was writing out charts for big bands and conducting big bands. and It came in handy later. I was working with Aerosmith. We were playing on Saturday Night Live, and uh, I got to conduct the horn section on the Saturday Night Live band for that song, 
uh, crying. Ba 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 ba. Yeah. Like, oh, all right, let's take it from bar of seventeen, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> It was so much fun. I was like, if my mama could see me now. <laughs> so you're like a kid in a candy store there. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was really, really fun to try and utilize some of that training. But the cool thing about Berkeley is they, they give you a ton of knowledge. And I was thirsty for knowledge. I couldn't get enough. And then they tell you, you have to sort of forget that now and go back to playing from your soul, your you know, your core, hmm. your your real essence. That's what people are interested in. They don't want to hear you do scales or arpeggios. All the stuff we've been working on, that's to get you ready to go out hmm. and really find your voice. And I was so lucky to have an incredible sax teacher, Joe Viola, one of the best ever. And that's what he always talked about, find your voice so like you could sing through your saxophone. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, musicians of note have come through uh, Berkeley College of Music. Did you did you jam with anybody there that you know who, who's also a big time rock star like yourself? No, I don't think so. I was sort of underground. <laughs> I was re- oh, okay. we were definitely we were the rebels because we were like jazz. Oh, forget jazz. Uh, now gotcha. let's go play the Sex Pistols. Uh, you know, <laughs> jazz is <laughs> it's so hard. You know, jazz is really hard, and I don't yeah. work that hard. You know, but uh, <laughs> so we were sort of rebelling. Uh, eventually, my teacher said, "Look, either get serious or get out." And uh, that's when you realize, oh man, I really have to practice. And it's true, <laughs> you do. Their their attitude was like, if you're not going to do it, go home and let someone else come in that will do it. Uh, make yeah. up your mind. So after my first semester, I had to make up my mind, and I, I went with a program. I was practicing five or six hours a day, and uh, that's what the doctor ordered. You do that for a lot of years, and I think there's a, a rule somewhere that if you do something for 10,000 hours, you become an expert at it, hopefully. Oh, I'm sure you got that 10,000 hours in a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. You probably yeah, passed my, that mark. <laughs> well, my family will testify to that. They're like, oh, stop playing, you know, in the basement, <laughs> like Christmas Eve. i got to practice five, six hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you go, so what happens after Berkeley? Where you, go to, you go to the West Coast? What do you do? I was in Boston, and there was a great scene in Boston. Lots of rock bands playing in clubs. You could do your original music. I was working my way up in the club scene. We had a little band. We did our own songs, and uh, I I got to open for some national acts, and one of the bands was John Butcher, and so Mm. he had a band called the John Butcher Axis. Right, uh, yeah. I got to open for him. I got to know him, and I sat in on saxophone, and I'll never forget the first time I played with him afterwards. He said, whoa, on that saxophone, man. Kids, both barrels blazing. (laughs) <laughs> oh, cool. I hope that's good. And so I, I worked with him for years. We made three albums on Capitol Records and uh, the Boston Connection. That was what led to Aerosmith. In 1989, uh, I got a call from the Aerosmith guys. So I started working with them 89, 90. That's the Pump Tour. And then uh, 93, 94, the Get a Grip Tour. That was 20 months uh, it was a worldwide tour. They both were world tours. The first one was a year. The second one was 20 months. So uh, what an experience. You know, after that, uh, I was so lucky to find a home in Foreigner. Uh, you know, to play guitar and sax and work with Mick Jones, it's been the best I could hope for. Uh, let's back up to Aerosmith for a minute. Um, uh-huh. Uh, t- give me, because John, John uh, your publicist, uh, John Lappin, uh, <laughs> told me that he said, make sure you ask Tom, uh, I'll to tell you some stories. So give me a give me an era. now. I mean, I I don't want anybody to get sued or get in trouble. But tell me uh-huh. a, tell me an Aerosmith story because those guys, you know, come on, freaking Aerosmith, well, you know. Yeah, I know. But at that point, they were really clean and sober and yeah. just into working mm-hmm. out of the gym and everything. Uh, so it was it was a situation where there was a lot of healthy things going on, but they, they still had an, a rock and roll attitude, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're not saintly people, but uh, <laughs> that's rock and roll, you know. If they weren't, of course, they wouldn't be Aerosmith. But crazy but, stuff happens, no no matter, even if yes. you're straight, you know, sober or oh, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, crazy yeah. stuff always happens. <laughs> and, and Steven Tyler, he's just so he's just so crazy. I remember one night uh, Jimmy Page was going to sit in, and it was at the uh, arena, this giant soccer like stadium in Brazil. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> There's like 100,000 people, 80,000 people in this place. And Jimmy Page is going to come out and do Train Kept a Rolling all night long. So 
I, I said to Stephen and Joe Perry, uh, are you guys going to talk to to Jimmy Page a little bit about like how to do the song or where to come in or how it goes or anything? And they looked at each other and with silent communication, and they just both turned to me and at the same time said, "No." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I said, "Oh, well, okay. I just, you know, I was sorry. <laughs> sorry, I blew up. You know, <laughs> call me crazy." So we went out there, and of course, the whole thing was like a train wreck. You know, <laughs> the, cr- the, cr- the crowd didn't notice. Nobody cared. I just remember eighty thousand people were still going, "Jimmy Page, Jimmy Page, Jimmy Page." Uh, so those are the kind of things you remember, and you just laugh laugh and laugh but um, yeah a lot of fun stuff did happen I remember the last night of the tour Stephen Tyler he just you know it's a tradition on the last night of the tour you sort of play tricks or pranks on each other mm-hmm. and I grabbed my saxophone and Stephen had soaked the, the, the reed in Tabasco sauce oh. for, for like a day he like oh got, my God. <laughs> as soon as the day started he had them put it in a, a jar of Tabasco sauce Oh my God. I was trying to play the sax, and I couldn't believe he did it. He got me, and he just came over. He was singing, standing next to me, and laughing at the same time. And yeah, I, you know, it was just like a giant Tabasco saxophone at that point. <laughs> so basically, it's like it's like you know a bunch of like adolescents uh, <laughs> traveling a around bit. the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit, but it was really fun, like a barrel of monkeys. There was a time at the Saturday Night Live when he got into a shouting match with uh, Chris Farley. Oh, boy. And Yeah, this was Chris Farley's heyday, and uh, Aerosmith, too. And they, someone said, you know, hey, I think you're awesome. And then Chris Farley said, no, you're awesome. And then Stephen Tyler said, no, you're awesome. And they went back and forth, and it got louder and louder, and they were going crazier and crazier. And it just sort of stopped the whole production. Everybody saw and they had the shouting match. And, uh, I think it was a tie. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so what is uh, what's up with Foreigner? You guys are approaching what? You got like a 40th anniversary yeah. or something coming up? What is that? This year or next year? Yeah, well, it's right in between. Uh, the band was formed in '76, but the first album came out in '77. Yeah, so yeah. That, that'll be the 40th uh, anniversary of the first release. So, what are you guys doing to celebrate that? You got to be have something really awesome coming out. I think there should be, uh, it's still in the planning stages, so we're not 100% sure, and, and you mm-hmm. hate to kind of guess until it's official. So I got there should be some, yeah, there should be some information pretty soon. I know that they're working on it, but, uh, you know, only only Mick Jones could say for sure what the future is of, of Florida. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> what, I, okay, I got it, I got it. I got it. There's probably some top secret stuff in there, too. Um, <laughs> so... So how does how do you feel about foreigners? Like the unplugged thing happened, you know, in the in the late '90s, or yeah, over in the '90s, um, oh, and yeah. it seems like a lot of people have kind of like translated their music into into acoustic. Like, kind of, how do you feel about that? I mean, because you know, you play with these really big rock bands like John Butcher Axis, uh, Aerosmith, mm-hmm. Foreigner, really hard drive. Even though Foreigner had a lot of ballads and stuff like that, they're primarily known as electric. Um, how do you feel that works, and how do you feel that translates to acoustic? I always like it, uh, and mm-hmm. it goes way it goes way back. You're right. One of the first MTV unplugged was Aerosmith in 1990, and uh, there I had this upright piano, and I played a little saxophone and sang, singing. But uh, it just it always seems to me like it, it, the songs are the main ingredient, and that's like your girlfriend. That's like her soul. You know, or you know, your your significant other, a girl or guy, uh, it's their soul, and and so whether it's acoustic or electric, seems to me like the, the the way they're dressed. One, you know, is dressed up like the full bells and whistles, dressed to the nines. There she is, diamonds and furs, or, or whatever your version of mm. dressed to the nines. It could be UGG boots and uh, a loincloth, you know. But uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> dressed up just the way you like to see her. And then the other way is sort of stripped down, shall we say, uh, maybe wearing some unmentionables. That would be the acoustic show. Okay. <laughs> All right. So in our in our presentation, sometimes we like to have the best of both worlds, a little bit of each, 
but I just love them both. And honestly, it's because the songs are so good that they hold up in, in this in this way. Both formats, the songs just shine, and that's a really a credit to the craftsmanship of uh, Mick and Lou writing those writing those hits. Yeah, some really amazing stuff. Um, what what are the audiences like these days? I mean, you know, the band started. Now we're looking at forty years ago. Um, you know, are, are, are you see? Are you seeing younger people still kind of rocking out the Farner? Like, wh- what's the scene sort of like with Farner? It's funny. There's a large uh, range of, of different age groups that are at the shows now. We we spanning the generations, probably four or five generations. And we've seen little kids, like, on their parents' shoulders. We had a little guy out there one night with a crew cut, and he's, like, doing the sign of the devil. You know, he's, like, singing the words, the jukebox hero. And it's just awesome. So uh, that would be, if the youngest, uh, a lot of those kids think the lyrics are juice box hero. But that's okay. <laughs> we're, we're, we don't really mind. And it goes all the way up to our contemporaries. So uh, it's just multiple generations. But uh, more and more uh, people come into the shows from all the different generations, not really one in particular. But uh, it's like the, the fan base is growing um, as the years go by. The music is holding up so well. And people are discovering things. And certainly the people in their 20s and 30s are feel like they're discovering this music and uh, other ones grew up with it because their parents were playing it but uh, a lot of young younger people like to feel like they found you know they found something i used to do that i would dig around the basement and i would find my parents old records mm-hmm. and for, for me it was like louis armstrong and uh, who was that uh, trombone player glenn livett or somebody like that anyway um <laughs> <laughs> we got a case of Glenn Livett, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you're uh, oh goodness, you're, yeah, you're cracking me up, man. Um, so, so the the, the yeah, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. So, okay, you, you're playing with Foreigner, Paris, all the time. Will there ever be a Tom Gimble band? I don't know. I don't know. I. I I think I, I really enjoy what we're doing right now. And, and mm-hmm. foreign, Foreigner, we've got some years to go. So maybe after maybe after that wraps up, it's certainly mm-hmm. a possibility. It's certainly a possibility. But uh, I, Do you I thought about doing... Yeah, I thought about doing some, some recording on my own. And I just... I can't figure out which instrument to play. So that keeps me... <laughs> <laughs> frozen, and so while I decide, I have to go play golf and think about it, and that's you know taking me through the years. Okay, now wait a minute. So now we got to get into golf because golf, you know, not you know you you play all these mm. other instruments, Aerosmith, a uh, foreigner, all this stuff, but you're also really passionate about golf. Yes, yes now, I know nothing I... about golf, so so talk, talk, I like a total golf like uh-huh. idiot here. So go ahead. Oh, and what, what, tell, 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 I. I Tell me, just talk to me about golf. What is golf all it's about? Really, it's something to do while you're outside. I did a lot of <laughs> hiking, and biking and hiking. I go down to the lake and look at the water. And after a few minutes, I'm like, okay, what do we do now? So basically, golf is for people like me that uh, you know have short attention span but really want to be outside. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just It keeps you occupied, and it's like a puzzle and game and a sport and, a, and an outdoor activity all rolled into one. And uh, so, you know, you can if you play other sports, you can use what you did in other sports and just go out there and have fun. I think people consider it to be more difficult than it really is. But now that uh, they're understanding how the brain works, the modern teachers will ask you what sports have you played, and then they're going to show you how to use that skill set because your brain doesn't know the difference. And in mm. reality, golf is actually easier because the ball's not moving. You know, if it's tennis or baseball you might have played when you were younger, that's harder than golf because the, the ball's just sitting there like a tee, you know, like a tee uh, ball. Yeah. So once we get that through our minds, it becomes a lot easier. And it's just fun. It's just fun to be outside, uh, guys getting games and, and make fun of each other. And uh, men and women play together in a, a foursome. I know that sounds a bit risque, but no, in <laughs> golf. <laughs> it's just the name of a golf game. And uh, so it's wonderful. People meet 
out there. I've met so many great people on golf courses, and you just have a lot of laughs and a lot of fun. I hit one in the water the other day. It went plunk, and I just laughed so hard because the sound it made. We were in Mexico, and I thought I was gonna, the Gators were going to file a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> they returned the ball. They're like, get this out of here, you know. We're trying to sleep. <laughs> there were so many gators. There was nothing but gators in that pond. So I felt bad. But uh, after I apologized, they gave me the ball back. <laughs> and uh, we all had to the ball. So you're not, you're not, uh, you're not like bound for like a, the PGA or anything. This is something you do as a no. kind of race. It's fun. No, it's for fun. Yeah. And a lot of times if you go to the tournaments, like I played in the George Lopez tournament this year, that's mm-hmm. for charity. Most of these charities are for are, are, most of these tournaments are for charities, and they raise money. It was just fantastic what George did to help children in Los Angeles. Uh, and all the tournaments that I've done over the years were always for really good benefits and charities and fundraisers. Uh, Vince Neal has one. We were lucky enough to play in that, and this goes on and on and on. So golf does a lot of good things for a lot of people, and it also brings people together. It's considered one of the social games. Golf and tennis are social games. So uh, that's got to tell you something, you know. It's it's better than staying inside and and working on the Nintendo or whatever. (laughs) Um, (laughs) With with your jazz background, I I was kind of wondering, and with your, you know, interest in... I could talk about jazz. I could talk about jazz forever. (laughs) I have I have such a deep love for jazz. I still listen to so much of it. Uh, we 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 talk about it a lot out on the road. Our keyboard player Michael Bluestein is also a Berkeley graduate, and so we'll be talking about Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and, and Billy Cobham and our drummer. Everyone gets that. Even our bass player is also a, a Jeff Pilson, also a graduate of right. a music degree. So we talked a lot about jazz. We still listen to it. And I'm just still a huge fan. I I, just, I could put on my uh, Stan Getz or uh, it's really for a daily basis, it's more about Al Green, but I don't know if that would be considered jazz in the traditional sense. Uh, but when it comes to traditional jazz, I still love the stuff that I loved as a kid, like Weather Report, um, the old George Benson stuff on CTI Records, uh, Bob James. All kinds of stuff like that, and of course Miles Davis. I I, I can listen to Miles. He's really my hero uh, because of the lyric way that he played. Uh, I I try to think about that when I'm playing. I try to think about putting words behind the the notes and and playing in sentences as if you're speaking, mm-hmm. like we talked about with Joe Viola, "Find Your Voice." But you know, with Miles Davis, it's now what do you do with that voice? You know how do you speak in musical phrases? And so he's my hero when it comes to that because I love understated phrasing like that where less is more and you can say more with fewer notes. And that What's your favorite really, Miles album? Yeah, it's probably going to be kind of blue. Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 yeah, that's going to be the one. But I have one that's, um, I sort of got off of iTunes and it's like the best, the best of Miles Davis or the best of a, a collection like that that's also extremely superb. And um, I'm starting to get into the, 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 the later stuff, too, like Bitches Brew and, mm-hmm. you know, and hearing Joe Zawinul on, on, the, on the roads with the Wawa pedal and stuff. I'm starting to get it. You know, it's kind of out there, but I'm kind of digging it. Uh, so I, I would have to say I'm a fan of all his different phases. Did you like his uh, – see, I, I actually, I saw him in the 80s. Um, uh-huh. I was just kind of getting into jazz too. I saw him like when he was uh, doing like uh, he had cool uh, remakes of like Human Nature by Michael Jackson oh, and stuff like yeah. that. And I thought I mean, he got kind of like some jazz purists didn't kind of like that, but I saw him and I thought it was beautiful. No problem. You know? yeah. yeah, I've seen I've seen a clip of that on YouTube. I watched a clip of that on YouTube uh, because I'm such a fan and I'm a, I'm knocked out by that rendition of it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, being in Foreigner, is is are there times to do you guys get to jam, or is or is everything pretty much you know, you know, once, note for yeah, note once in a while. Yeah, if we get the sound check uh, once in a while, we, we will get to jam a little bit. And Nick Jones he always likes that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he'll come into sound check. He's more interested in jamming than he is in playing the intro to Head Games. You know, <laughs> <laughs> all right. We want to get the soundtrack, but he's he's like, oh, let's 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 riff out a little bit. And I think he's always looking for little snippets. 
he actually told us once that that's how he writes songs and that's how Urgent came about was just from that little guitar riff. Bow, 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 bow. Apparently, he played that for Mutt Lang, and Mutt Lang said, hey, there's something there. Let's work with that and turn it into a song, which they did, uh, which Mick you know, really did, along with Lou, and they wrote Urgent because of that. He found it on a little cassette somewhere. So he's always looking for little sparks like that, and sometimes if we're jamming at a rehearsal, he'll say, someone have a tape recorder. I love using those phrases from the last century. <laughs> tape recorder. <laughs> tape recorder. What? I, I kind of like drew a blank. Tape recorder, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the day will come when no one will know what that means, and it's coming fast. It's probably already here. <laughs> You're like, dot com. That day was here 10 years ago. Uh, but, I know. <laughs> That's all right. I don't mind dating myself. How yeah. big of a kick is that to be on stage and be able to? I mean, you're up there. You're playing the freaking solo to Urgent. Oh, I mean, that's like cool. iconic. I mean, that's like you know, that's getting up like being able to get up there and say you were in playing Led Zeppelin and playing the intro to Stairway to Heaven. You know, I mean, that's like <laughs> yeah, it's so fun because right before the solo hits, I I do that pa pa da pa 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 yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'll go over and I'll kind of look at Mick Jones and, uh, you know, try and make some kind of face that makes him laugh. <laughs> you know, there's only so much you can do while you're playing the saxophone, but I'll do like some funny look in my eyes or something and see if I can get him to crack a smile and then just go from there. So it, oh, I really, that's sort of my favorite point of the night is, is trying to make him laugh. And then at the end we do the same thing, so. What a kick. I, yeah, it's indescribable. It just puts a huge smile on my face right now, thinking about it. And it's hard to play the sax and smile at the same time. I, uh, <laughs> I don't think it's really possible. You can grin, but uh, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I don't think there'd be much sound if you're really smiling. Um, Tom, before we wrap up, like, is there anything you would like to talk to say about, about, about Farn or anything you have going on, anything you'd like the audience to know about? Uh, you sure. or Farner or what's happening? Yeah. Well, this band is, is tremendous. Kelly Singer, uh, Kelly Hansen, our singer, uh, if anyone doesn't know, they should know. He's been doing it for over 10 years now, so it's not it's not news or anything. But right. the way he fronts this band, you have to see it to believe it. He it just sings to perfection, and he runs around and interacts with the crowd. He's one of those people that wants the crowd to get involved. Uh, so... There's no real barrier there. We don't try to block the crowd out. We want to bring them in. And uh, so that's really that's really a, makes it a lot of fun. And I, I just can't say enough about the band in general. Of course, Mick Jones, the leader and founder, phenomenal, uh, everything, world-class songwriter, in the Songwriters Hall of Fame now. So uh, obviously that's – but as just as a person, you could never hope to meet a nicer guy or a classier guy. So uh, those are the main two characters. Of course, we have Jeff Wilson on bass. Uh, he's also a freight train. And the rest of the guys are a bunch of knuckleheads. I mean, that goes without saying. We're talking about a rock band. You know, it's, it's 100% goofball. We're just joking around all the time and playing tricks on each other. We have a blast out there. So uh, whenever we're playing, we're, we feel like we're working with old friends and hopefully making new friends and, and having a having a blast it's just one big uh, sing-along um are you so are you on the road right now we will be uh starting again thursday we're, we're on a mini micro break now for a couple of day, days and then we'll start up again after thursday how uh like uh, how many days out of the year are you guys uh, touring it's usually around 115 shows so that translates to ooh, right around 200 days a year gone out of town but uh, if you want to be in the rock and roll business, that's what you hope for. So we're delighted yeah. that uh, we have that many shows and we're just going full strength. All right, you told me a crazy, we'll wrap up with one more thing. You told me a crazy Aerosmith story. T- okay. Tell me, tell me, and you, you sort of he told me some good foreigner stories too about trying to make uh, Mick <laughs> crack up and stuff like that. But tell, t- tell, me, something, tell me something wacky uh, from, the, from your, uh, your tenure here with Foreigner. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we, well, uh, we were playing in, in Paris, France, 
and it was uh, one of those European stages where in between songs it would be kind of dark and sometimes in the middle of the song it would be kind of dark and our singer somehow fell down in under the stage Kelly Hansen he was oh, one minute no. he was there and the next minute he was gone and we were looking around just going anyone know where he went uh no but his voice kept coming over his microphone okay <laughs> so he had fallen down into this hole in the stage and mangled himself down there but continued to sing of course and eventually we fished him out and got him some painkillers. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> he and I went to the bar after that, got some painkillers, got on the bus, and uh, we just never forgot. It. That's the kind of guy he is. He's that dedicated to his art. Same the thing show must go on. Yeah, the same thing happened with Mick Jones. I looked over one day, and this was outdoors, and he was just gone. And we figured out he had fallen off the stage into the crowd. He was in the seats had landed in the seats sort of upside down, but he still had his guitar. He was still playing. <laughs> oh my God. I, I was just like thinking you could going to break something, you know, like break I your know. neck or your hand or. I don't know. You would uh. think, but no, <laughs> sometimes musicians, while they're playing music, apparently they bounce or something good happens. Really? They move they, around musicians. I can't believe that. <laughs> now, I, 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 I think you're BSing me now. Well, we've all fallen off the stage. If you talk to most musicians, they'll think we've all fallen. Yeah, that, yeah, that happens <laughs> to the best different of us. Ver- yeah, different versions of the same story. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tom, th- thanks a lot, man, for taking some time out to talk uh, with us. Um, could you, uh, I need to uh, thank my sponsor one more time and wrap up. Could you sure. hang on for a minute and we could do like a bonus question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay, all right. Hey, guys, you've been listening to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. Uh, today we were talking with uh, Tom Gimble from uh, the band Farner and, of course, Aerosmith. But he's with Farner right now. It's really exciting stuff. If you want to uh, find out what Farner's up to, it's real simple. It's real simple. Go to FarnerOnline.com, and you can see everything that's going on. They've, there's some great videos up there, some cool uh, – so I watched an awesome uh, – piece on Mick Jones from, uh, I believe, CBS Sunday Morning. Very cool stuff on there. So go to foreigneronline.com. Uh, you're listening to the Ludini Rock and Roll Circus. Please check out our website, ludinirockandrollcircus.com. Uh, for all your Ludini needs, is great. if you love interviews like this, there's a gazillion of them there. Plus, we do a music podcast every Saturday. And thanks once again to our sponsor, Positively Pittsburgh Live Magazine. That's pplmag.com. Check them out. Buy and do everything that they have there because they're great people and they support great rock and roll. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. You can find us again once more at ludinirockandrollcircus.com. We'll see you on the next podcast. <laughs>